Greetings, friends and brethren around the world. This is Alexander Sashavelich for the Continuing Church of God. Happy Pentecost, happy Feast of First Fruits. We are celebrating another of God's holidays. The first man who began and he was keeping the holidays by faith without understanding their deep meaning was late Pastor General of the Worldwide Church of God, Herbert W. Armstrong, with his wife Loma. They understood that the holidays were commanded by God, but they did not understand what they exactly meant. It took about seven years until the uh, Armstrong couple understood the deep meaning of the holidays. Uh, this is exactly what the Church of God, the widest community and various churches of God today understand as a legacy of Herbert Armstrong. They do understand the meaning of the holidays and why do we keep them. While the other churches of God have about 50 or more prophetic errors in their teachings, Nevertheless, when it comes to the holidays, they all more or less do understand the meaning of the of these holidays. And the continuing Church of God is not the exception. Now, it is the Feast of First Fruits. It is the first of, it is basically the, uh, the third holiday. We had the Feast of uh, Unleavened Bread, and now we've come to the Day of Pentecost. And late Herbert Armstrong often used to begin his holiday message with a question, any holiday message. The question was, so brethren, why are we here? He asked this question because he understood how often we needed brethren to be reminded. God understands this too, and that is why he has given us his annual Sabbaths, because they serve as a reminder. God does not only want to, us to know why we are here, but it should define who we are. So the appropriate question on this specific holiday, the day of Pentecost, the day of the, the Feast of the First Fruit is, who are we? You see, our identity determines how we think and how we react to our environment. We are to live by the Holy Spirit. We live in an environment that is not of the Spirit. The environment is a world totally contrary to God's way. So it becomes ever more so important that we know our spiritual identity. The understanding of who we are is crucial to our ability to fulfill our calling and our purpose in life. That we understand and uh, we understand what this day, the day of Pentecost, represents. And that we understand that it's crucial to our understanding of who we are. In order for us to understand who we are, we need to start at the beginning. Herbert Armstrong always said, you don't know where you are going to end up if you don't know where you started from. Well, indeed, we cannot understand where we are and where we are going unless we know what led us here. So let us turn to the beginning, to Genesis chapter 1. If you have your Bible, please follow along. And it will be very useful to jot some notes as well, because uh, they're very helpful in uh, following the message and later in your personal Bible study. God created and then replenished the earth. He created each living thing after their own kind. But in verse 26 of Genesis 1, we find that he created humankind after something else. Then God said, let us make men in our image after our likeness. Man was not made like any other of the living organisms. The word here is used, it's the Hebrew word nefesh. You see, we are flesh. We are temporary beings or organisms, but we were made differently from other creation. Man was made after God. Man was not made just like God, but he was made in God's image and his likeness. Man was not immortal, but was created with a mind that could think like God's mind, with reason and the ability to create, to take what God had given him and where he had placed him and then literally create with this mind, with his mind, just like God. Man was given a mind that could make choices. God gave man this mind so he could rule over God's earthly creation. In verse, verse, in verse 26, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So God made both men and women with minds that could think and choose. He wanted men to qualify to rule over his creation so that God's government could be reestablished on the earth and Satan could be removed from his earthly throne. Continuing in verse 28, and God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it 
and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Please drop to verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Now the question is, why did God call it good? In fact, he said very good in the New King James Version. Well, it was good because, brethren, he put humankind in a garden, which signifies the whole earth itself, in which humans had everything physically they needed to physically survive. Man was created with the ability to learn from God when he was put in that garden and to become like God. He wasn't given only the physical, the good trees, but he was also given the capability in that garden to have a relationship with God. God's ultimate goal was for humankind to grow in that garden, to have access to him and to become his children and eventually to become immortal as God himself. Then in Genesis chapter 2 verse 8, And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made the spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Now again, you see, part of this being good is that God put him there, so he had created everything uh, that man had that he needed to, for physical sustenance. So man had everything physical that he needed, but and a woman, of course, they had everything they needed, but there was something else that humans needed, brethren. Verse 9, the tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil. And then we drop to verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of the good of you and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now again, that's the symbolism we understand well. God, who has all knowledge of salvation, wanted humankind to look to him. Not just the physical surroundings, but he gave them those two trees to look at from a point of view of what they needed beyond the physical. God gave humankind free access to himself through the tree of life, the creator of the universe. The tree of life would give humankind God's Holy Spirit, thus enabling them to live the correct way of life, allowing the family relationship, and that's why he is called the Father, you see? So that humankind so desperately needed that relationship with its creator. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil represented humankind deciding for himself what was good and evil without God's divine guidance. We go to Genesis now, chapter 3, verse 6 and 7. So when the woman saw that a tree, that is speaking of the knowledge of good and evil, that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight into the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves lame cloths. This is the New King James Version, by the way. So you see what happened was that humankind at that moment decided to make its own way in the world, and to define its purpose for itself, separated totally from God. Humans did not want God telling them what to do. So instead of choosing the tree of life, they decided that they were going to decide their own way. Now remember, God wanted humankind, brethren, to have free access to the tree of life. Now, what was God's response from the very beginning in the garden, uh, in the garden to that? Well, verse 22, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever, they would live forever then in sin and in total misery. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the men at the east of the Garden of Eden. He placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So ever since then, brethren, the exit of the tree of life was bare, barred, was forbidden to all humankind. Now, just like any father of a family whose children are old enough to decide that they know a better way, God let humankind learn on its own. He said, well, if you wish to do this, this is the circumstance. So God shut off open access to humankind as a whole, to himself and his Holy Spirit. Though he did this, 
we have to remember that he did give them the original access to the tree and that his original intent never changed, never meaning to this very day and this very age, brethren. It was still God's desire for all of humankind to fulfill the ultimate destiny of becoming a child of God, having a vibrant, loving family relationship with him and assisting in reestablishing of God's government. God did not want humankind to perish. He desired salvation still for humankind. He tells us that in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1 through 4, 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1, First of all, writes the Apostle Paul, Then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So you see, just because humankind itself has made that decision, it did not change God's desire for humankind because God plans continue, God, God's plan continues. And that's exactly the meaning of the holidays. The holidays that God has given, not to the Jewish people, not only to Israelites, but for all humankind is so that we would understand the way that he is working out salvation for all humankind. Now, due to the garden's sin, God began to take a hands-off type of approach to humankind not from the point of view of his plan, but to each individual or the majority of people's lives. He would just let them go their own way as they have chosen so that they would learn on their own. But God still did not stop working with humankind, brethren, only that he was not working with many people. On the contrary, he began working with only certain individuals as to serve to fulfill his ultimate purpose in bringing humankind into a relationship with him and to establish his kingdom here on the earth. It was only a few to which he gave his spirit, as we know from the Old Testament. So let's turn now to Hebrews 11 to rehearse this understanding, because it is interesting from the beginning of Adam and Eve until the flood, that there were only a few people that were mentioned, and few people who had you no know, relationship with God. Hebrews 11 verse 4, by faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commanded as righteous. God commanding him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, the second death that is, and we can explain it in some other, some other time, that he should not see death, and he was not found. You see, it's in the future that he should not see death. So it's not the first death, it's the second death anyway, because God had taken him or had actually hidden his corpse so that uh, they would, that, that, so that people would not take his corpse and worship him, just like what he did with Moses. You know, he hid Moses because what, what the Israelites would have done had they known where the Moses grave is, they would have made a whole shrine and they would have, glor they would have deified Moses and would have, you know, would have created a whole cult of Moses. God certainly didn't want that to happen. Now, before he was taken, meaning Enoch, he was com commended as having pleased God. You see, in order to please God, we have to have faith. And in order to have faith, we have to have the Spirit of God. So Enoch, obviously, had God's Spirit. Verse 6, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, now we go, go on to see more individuals in the Old Testament. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Now, 2,000 years of man's history, brethren, and only these three names are mentioned. But it shows that God still had his intent of giving man his spirit and working out his purpose. Then we come to Genesis chapter 12. We see the next individual that God chose and began to work with. Genesis 12 verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make you your name great so that you will be a blessing I'll bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you. I'll curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now this blessing has 
uh, a dual meaning. Of course, all the families will be blessed because of Jesus Christ, who is descendant of Abraham. But also, this has the, uh, since the Old Testament was based on physical promises, this also has a physical connotation into it. Anyway, so we see God calling the man who would eventually be named Abraham, as well as God's purpose for calling him out. The purpose was that all the families of the earth shall be blessed through Abraham's calling. And brethren, this reiterates God's ultimate purpose for men. God did not call Abram for Abram's salvation, just like he did not call us for our own salvation. It's given, it's, uh, 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 it's uh, understood. Yes, you see, through obedience and belief in God, Abraham gained salvation, just like we will if we endure to the end. But God's ultimate purpose never altered. Because Abraham's calling was to serve God's ultimate purpose of bringing all humankind, all the families of the earth, into a relationship with God for salvation, as well as establishing God's kingdom back on this earth. So it was through Abraham that God began to work with a group of people now. We move from just a few to Abraham with a promise to a group. So God promised childless Abraham an heir through whom God would raise up a people for himself. And of course, he raised up the house, the house of Israel, people for himself. And the house of Israel was supposed to be the example to all the other nations and to lead all the other nations into a relationship with God. That did not happen in the Old Testament, but yet indeed it will happen after Christ's return in the New Testament that will be established with the remnant of the house of Israel. In Genesis 15, verse 12, through 14, we read the following. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. Thou will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. He's speaking, of course, of the uh, house of Israel, of the 12 tribes of Israel that were rescued from Egypt, at that time the most, the, the most powerful country in the world. And then verse 18 continues. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your offspring, I'll give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river of Euphrates, the land of Canaanites, Canaanites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. And then we find Moses, another man God has chosen to assist him in accomplishing his ultimate purpose in Exodus chapter 6. We find Moses now leading, of course, the nation that was supposed to be God's nation, leading them out and out of Egypt and towards the promised land. Exodus 6 verse 2 and forward. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I've remembered my covenant, my covenant with Abraham. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I'll bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I'll deliver you from slavery to them, and I'll redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I'll take you to be my people. So God began bringing to moving from just a few individuals to where he was taking a group of individuals and working with them. That group, as we know, numbered about 3 million people at that time. And I'll be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who was, has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Verse 8, I'll bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I'll give it to your, you for a possession. I am the Lord. So you see, God chose the children of Israel now to be his family. He took a common people and revealed to them all that was holy. He gave them his law, his statutes, his judgments. And Jewish tradition has it that on this day, the day of Pentecost, God gave the physical law to Israel that they 
he gave them the law of the Mount Sinai, and that the uh, he spoke with his own voice. They couldn't see any image. With his own voice, he thundered his law into their ears in hope that in spite of their stony hearts, they may heed what he was telling them and obey him and thus inherit the promised land. Now, they disobeyed, but their children, their uh, descendants, the next generation then inherited the promised land. Anyway, we see that God poured out his mercy on them, brethren, in patience. For a period of over 1,000 years, the house of Israel kept straying, straying away, drifting away, rebelling, but God continued to send men who had his Holy Spirit with which he would lead them. He sent Moses, Joshua, numerous judges, Samuel, David, Nathan, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Ezra, Nehemiah, and all the other prophets, and yet the house of Israel failed to obey God. Their hearts were as hard as stone on which God wrote his Ten Commandments. Now, all the names I've just mentioned, those people, brethren, were righteous men. They gained salvation by serving to forward God's ultimate purpose. But in the end, the house of Israel never became the example that he wanted them to be to the people around them. But because of Israel's disobedience, it serves as a lesson to us and eventually for all humankind that without God's Holy Spirit, it is impossible to live God's way of life. But, you know, God's Holy Spirit symbolized by the tree of life that was first rejected was cut off from humankind because of man's original and continual sin. Yet, for men to obey God, he had to have God's Spirit. But again, we have to remember that God's ultimate desire and purpose of having a relationship with humankind and the reestablishment of the kingdom of the earth, that's his ultimate purpose. It was God's desire and plan to give humankind nevertheless access to his Spirit. And this is all the meaning of this wonderful holiday we're keeping today. If you go back to Hebrews, let's go to chapter 8. We are going to read several verses in chapter 8. And then after that, we'll go to the Gospel of John in chapter 16. Now in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would, be have, there would have been no occasion to look for a second for he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant. As we know, we have seen that in all the books of the prophets, in the kings, and in the... Uh, uh, other scriptures in the Bible. And so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. You see, God was not going to give just his laws and his holy things as he did to the house of Israel. God was going to give his spirit without which we cannot live God's way of life. Drop to verse 10 and 11. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I'll put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. And I'll be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. So, brethren, the God's original purpose and desire was to give humankind his Holy Spirit, which he finally did give humankind his Holy Spirit on this very day. So, we see that as he moved from individuals, to the house of Israel, that his whole desire was always to give them of his life and also to give them of his spirit, not just individuals, but also to give his law to the children of Israel. But God's spirit was cut off because of man's sin in the Garden of Eden. Now, what humankind needed was the second Adam to come who did not sin, one who would conquer Satan, qualify to reestablish God's government and hold death penalty that he would pay, the penalty of sin and ransom of humankind from Satan. And that's exactly what Christ the Messiah fulfilled this need. He did it. And then after that was done, then the access to God's Holy Spirit was finally open. The Messiah's death allowed the Holy Spirit to become available to humankind. Go to John chapter 16. 
verse 5, But now I am going to him who sent me, says Jesus Christ. And none of you asks me, where are you going? So this is Christ talking, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I'll send it to you. And when it comes, it will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, it will guide you into all the truth, for it will not speak of its own its authority, but whatever it hears, it will speak, and it will declare to you the things that are to come. It will glorify me, for it will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that he'll take what is mine and declare it to you. So, brethren, Christ's death, which allowed for the Spirit to come to humankind, ushered in another way for God to work with humankind. Now this all that I've just said serves as a background as we look at all the individuals. Why the Holy Spirit was not given to humankind, but only individuals, so eventually we needed another Adam, Christ, to come to live a sinless life and to die in order for us to have the Spirit. Go to Leviticus 23. That's the chapter that outlines God's holidays, the holidays that He commands us to keep. So let us look at the symbolism that is behind this day and how Pentecost represents the giving of God's Spirit to humankind. At this time, of the, of, of, in this age, in this dispensation, however you want to call it, to humankind, only to a very small part of humankind, so only to individuals, the first fruits. And then, of course, after the return of Jesus Christ, the access to God's Holy Spirit will be given exactly to all of humankind. Leviticus 23 defines the order of the holidays. And we know through the revelation of God that these days represent His great plan of salvation for humankind. That is, as I mentioned in the beginning, that is what the... Uh, Faithful servant of God, Herbert Armstrong, did understand after seven long years of keeping holidays without understanding. That's the exact understanding that we have as a legacy. And uh, in day and year, in and year out, we keep broadening and deepening our understanding of the wonderful meaning of God's holidays, which are termed by Protestants and others as Jewish holidays. Well, you find me in the Bible. Where does it say Jewish holidays? It says the days, the holidays of the Lord, they belong to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ kept them when he lived on this earth. After his death, his original church kept them. We see that in the book of Acts. All of God's holidays were kept by the apostles and by the primitive church. So they're not Jewish holidays, Israelites' holidays, any national holidays. No, they're the holidays that belong to God, sanctified by God himself, by God the Creator. By God of Israel, indeed, as he is revealed in the Bible, nevertheless, by God of the Bible. So he is. The, these are the days that are sanctified and holy for everyone, and that are to be kept by everyone, or at least by those who want to truly submit to God and be true Christians. So the holidays reveal how God is working out his ultimate desire and purpose of bringing humankind into a relationship with him, into salvation, and into the reestablishment of the kingdom of God on earth. In the day this chapter, Leviticus 23, was written, realized by that none of the fulfillment of any of these holidays were done. But for us today, the things have changed because we can look now back and see some of that fulfillment, only some. Verse 2 in Leviticus chapter 23, 23 describes God's Sabbath as a holiday. Again, it's the Sabbath of the Lord. It's not the Jewish Sabbath. It's not Israelite Sabbath. It's as it's being branded by the modern churchianity. No, it's God's Sabbath, the Sabbath of the Lord. Jesus Christ in Mark chapter 2 also said that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. He never changed it. He kept it. And when you look at the book of Acts, the primitive church, as well as the apostles, the apostolic church, they also kept this day as the only day of rest. Verse 4 describes the Passover and the days of the unleavened bread. The Passover has been fulfilled, indeed, when Christ came and died. 
Christ, the second Adam, he came qualifying through a sinless life and died to pay for the penalty of sin, enabling the Holy Spirit to be given. The days of unleavened bread represent how we need repentance to come out of sin and for Christ's life to dwell within us. And this brings us to verse 9 and begins to explain what had to take place before the day of Pentecost that had to take place before God could give his Holy Spirit to humankind. So Leviticus 23 verse 9. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. Now, most translations use the word sheaf, as I've just read in the New King James. The traditional name for this wave offering has been called the wave sheaf. The word sheaf in Leviticus 23 is translated from the Hebrew word omer. Omer means a dry measure of foodstuffs such as manna or grain. Now, another, according to the way in which we measure, it would be about half a gallon or in uh, European measures, it will be about two liters. Now, the Bible Knowledge Commentary states this about the sheaf. I'm quoting now. Barley was no doubt the sheaf to be offered because this feast occurs in March to April when barley was first harvested. Wheat was not readily available for harvest till later in June or July. And we are not right now in June. And we're right now so uh, in the season where we keep the feast of the first fruits. Verse 11. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. The Omer of barley, brethren, was waved before God on the day after the weekly Sabbath. So that means it was waved on Sunday, on a Sunday, during the days of unleavened bread. Because during the seven days of unleavened bread, there will be a weekly Sabbath. After the weekly Sabbath was over, when the sunset came, then on that Sunday, it will be weighed before the Lord. Uh, Jamison Fawcett and Brown commentary states concerning reaping that sheaf and how it was gathered. It says, it was reaped after sunset on the previous evening by persons deputized to go with sickles and obtain samples from different fields. These being laid together, in a sheaf or loosely bundled, were brought to the court of the temple, where the grain was winnowed, parched, parched, which means actually dried with some form of heat, and bruised in a mortar. So it was not finely ground, but it was put in a mortar and ground up, you see, in a crude way, you might say. Verse 14 reveals one last thing about this wave sheaf offering. Verse 14, and you shall eat neither bread nor grain parched or fresh, until this same day, until you have brought the offering of your God. It is a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. So verse 14 actually states that no other new grain was to be eaten until the wave sheaf was offered. You see, the harvesting of this sheaf had to take place before any other harvesting was to take place. Here is some more explanation from, again, Jamieson, Fawcett and Brown talking about this whole process. So I'm just reading these quotes from the commentary so that you would understand better what it is uh, revealed to us in Leviticus 23. Then it says, quote, then after some incense had been sprinkled on it, the priest waved the sheep before the Lord towards the four different points of the compass. So he would take it and wave it. Henceforth, the wave sheaf offering took a part of it and threw it into the fire of the altar all the rest being reserved to himself. It was a proper and beautiful act, expressive of the dependence of God for of providence, common among all people, but more especially becoming the Israelites who owed their land itself, as well as it produced to God's bounty. The offering of the wave sheaf sanctified the whole harvest. End of the quote. Now, in other words, the acceptance and the setting apart of the first harvest in Omer by God also allowed all the year's harvest to follow, to be set apart and sanctified by God. The wave sheaf had to be offered first, brethren. We need to understand that very well. So let us now look at the fulfillment of this wave sheaf of observance. The first key to understand 
or rather to understanding this observance is it's centering on a harvest. You see, God uses agricultural harvest to represent spiritual harvesting. That's his plan of salvation. You know, right now he's uh, harvesting uh, the first fruits of salvation. Later on, it will be the harvest of the general salvation of humankind. An example of this we have in Matthew 13, 24, where Christ uses reaping a harvest to describe how his people will be resurrected to eternal life. The harvest represents the resurrections from the dead to spiritual life. Let's turn now to John chapter 20, and let's see the fulfillment of the observance of the wave sheaf offering as it took place. Now, the later chapters of the Gospel of John, beginning with chapter 12, they outline Christ's last day, days on earth. On the Sabbath, previous to his crucifixion, he entered triumphantly on a donkey into Jerusalem. The following Tuesday evening, he instituted the New Testament Passover with his disciples. Later that night, he was arrested, and through the reminder of the night and the next morning, Wednesday, he was mocked, spat on, tried, scourged, and finally crucified on the tree. He died about the ninth hour, or in our uh, time reckoning, it will be 3 p.m. So he died on the tree on around 3 p.m. And by the time his body was removed from the tree, it was nearing sunset, the beginning of the first day of unleavened bread, the high annual Sabbath. So his body was treated quickly and placed in the tomb just as the sun was going down on Wednesday evening. So that gives us a time frame of his burial, which is important in understanding fulfillment of the wave sheaf. For we know Christ prophesied that he would remain in the tomb for three days and three nights. And this prophecy is pivotal in identifying Christ being the Messiah. Knowing this, three days and three nights take us from Wednesday evening to Saturday evening, at which time Christ, according to his own words, would have resurrected from the dead. Now, this is part of the fulfillment of the wave sheaf observance. We have read the commentaries that tell us how in the evening before the wave sheaf offering was made, the deputized men would go into the fields and reap the sheaf, bundle, parch, and grind it. Christ's physical harvest, the time he actually rose from the dead, Saturday evening, or as the evenings start for the next day, is directly coincided to when the men would go out to the different fields and harvest the sheaf, representing Christ's actual resurrection, his return from death to life, his return to life. In John chapter 20, verse 1, it says, and uh, all of us are familiar with this, but it's hopefully it will give us now deeper and better understanding. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. You see, it was still dark when she you know, arrived and the stone covering the tomb had already been removed. So this is another important fact, brethren, that we, you know, when the world celebrates Christ's resurrection on a Sunday morning, it has no connection to the Bible at all. You see, Mary came while it was still dark. As soon as the sun came down on, 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 on Saturday, she rushed to the, to the uh, graveyard and it was still dark and she finds that the tombstone already is removed. Because we know that Christ was resurrected Saturday evening or Saturday around sunset, and the stone was rolled away sometime between his resurrection and the time Mary arrived. Verses that now follow, verse 11 and beyond, they describe Mary. She ran to, the, to tell Peter and another disciple, probably John, who himself, who wrote this account. She ran to tell them that Christ's body was missing. Both came, looked, and returned home. Verse 13 now. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, brethren, verse 14 begins to reveal another important aspect of the way sheaf offering. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? 
Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I'll take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. So Mary realized now it was resurrected Jesus Christ. And of course, she wanted to run naturally and embrace him. But verse 17, Jesus said to her, do not cling to me. In other words, do not touch me. Do not hug me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Again, Christ instructed Mary not to touch him because, brethren, he had not yet ascended. He had not yet been waved before the Father, as we read in Leviticus. And the wave sheaf offering, waved before God, represented Christ's ascension to his Father for the first time after his resurrection. Verse 18, Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said, and she announced what he had said, all these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And this time they touched him. You see, from the time in which Mary saw him in the garden to that evening, and to that evening he had ascended to the Father, represented by the wave sheaf offering, and he came back, is the fulfillment of the actual words of Leviticus 23. So once again, from the time in which Mary saw him in the garden to that evening, he had ascended to the Father, represented by the wave sheaf. So I hope that now we understand that part of the scripture in Leviticus. Uh, please go to Romans chapter 8, because you see Christ was the firstborn by his uh, resurrection from the dead. He was the firstborn. He was the first to be harvested. He is the firstborn to be born. And we read about, it, we read about this now in Romans 8, verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be confirmed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, of course. Now, Christ was the first one to be resurrected. And as we read in Leviticus 23, verse 14, no other grain could be harvested until the way sheep was offered. No other grain could be harvested for eternal life. Which means, in a sense, like I tried to refer when I mentioned when I was reading about Enoch, Enoch certainly did not did not come back to life and he did not enter into eternal life before Christ. Enoch nor Elijah, those are misrepresentations, misunderstandings of the Protestants and others who misunderstand the scripture. No, nobody could have been harvested for eternal life before Jesus Christ. The problem is that people just misunderstand the scriptures, they misapply them, and millions of people sadly live in, uh, in total uh, confusion and misunderstanding of the Holy Scriptures. Meanwhile, the Bible is very simple and very clear to be understood. Yes, it's written in, uh, you know, it's kind of coded book, in codes. Yes, it's written in codes. But once you understand, once you connect, like in Isaiah 29 says, little was given here, little was given there. Little in this book, little in that book. When you bring all that together, and put all that together, the meaning of the scripture becomes crystal clear. So from the scriptures we have read so far, we have learned how humankind has been cut off from God. We have been reminded of God's ultimate desire to have a relationship with men. We have recalled how God worked with those individuals he chose before Christ came and died. We have also rehearsed the meaning of the wave shift offering being Christ, the first of the first fruits. So now, brethren, we're about to be reminded about the day of Pentecost in God's plan. Go back to Leviticus 23, and let's read verse, several verses in that chapter. Leviticus 23, verse 15. You shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. You shall count 50 days 
to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a grain offering of new grain to the Lord. So you see verse 15 states that seven complete weeks or 50 days, of which yesterday was 49, today makes 50, from the day the wave sheaf was offered to the whole to the holy day and the representation and the presentation of the next special offering to God. So uh, from that moment, wave sheaf offering, we count 50 days, and uh, you know, we come to the next holiday. The holiday was called the Feast of Weeks by the Israelites in the Old Testament. And it is called Pentecost in the New Testament using the Greek word count 50 because the Pentecost means 50th. Because on the 50th day, we keep it. The significance of the 50 days is about redemption. The 50 days literally tie, those 50 days literally tie that wave sheaf offering to the first fruits of, or, of the loaves. There are loaves, there are two loaves. Both were the first fruits. From the point of view of the wave sheaf offering itself, as a first fruit and also the two loaves offered on Pentecost were also first fruits. Now, of course, they don't represent Jesus Christ. He was, he, he was sinless. Obviously, they represent somebody else. Yes, brethren, it represents us. Verse 17. You shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread to be waved, made of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour, and they shall be baked with leaven as first fruits of the Lord. Is anybody there out there without sin? Regardless of the fact that we, of the fact that we are the first fruits, we still have we still have sins to battle in our lives. Verse twenty: And the priests shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord with the two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priests. So the first item concerning the wave loaves is, brethren, their content. Their content contents are not revealed here, but in Exodus chapter thirty-four. The contents of the uh, uh, loaf, way loaves, Exodus 34, verse 22, says, You shall observe the Feast of Weeks, the first fruits of wheat harvest. So the significance of that wheat is that this offering was from a different harvest. The way sheaf was from one harvest represented by barley, and these two loaves were from another harvest represented by wheat. They, but they still are both First fruits of the grain harvests. Another item concerning the loaves was that they were made with, as we have read, leavening. This is the one time in the year in which leaven was brought before God during the holiday offerings. None of it was burned on the altar, but it was brought before him. And the last item concerning the bread is that it was baked. You know, baking makes the product complete. The purpose for which it was harvested is realized. In the case of grain, it is now bread ready to be consumed or used for the specific purpose of forwarding God's kingdom. So it was completely made bread, not just the grain offering that was coarsely ground, like we have seen with the barley, but it was, you know, it was made of fine flour, grounded and complete. Now, what is the fulfillment of this observance involving the two loaves? Please go to Acts chapter 2 now. <coughs> you see, after Christ was resurrected, he remained with the disciples for 40 days, strengthening them. And in Luke 24, 49, Christ told them to remain in Jerusalem until the certain time. So the disciples remained together in Jerusalem. And now, in, then in Acts chapter 2, what happened? We read verse 1 and beyond. Verse 1, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. They were all in Jerusalem. So the disciples obeyed Christ and they remained together in Jerusalem and met together on Pentecost, 120 of them. They met together 50 days past the actual fulfillment of the wave sheaf offering, which is Christ's ascension to the Father. And after that 50 days, verse 2, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other, in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. 
it was on Pentecost, on this very day, that God began the new spiritual church by, or ecclesia by giving his Holy Spirit to those he called. The laws of Leviticus 23 represented his church, brethren. The church is composed of those who were once part of this world, living in sin, called out, given God's Spirit. God's Holy Spirit is placed into those he calls in his church, enabling Christ's mind to live within them and overcome their sins, the sins of the world and Satan, Christ, who is the author and finisher of our faith. That's exactly what it is. You see, that's what he promised in John 20, remember. He will go to the Father and then he'll send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit that will lead us into all the truth. So God's promise of giving his Spirit to humankind was and is being fulfilled. Verse 14, but Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, all those crowds that came because it was a it was a great holiday, so many uh, many uh, believers came from other parts of the of, of the world to Jerusalem to keep it, and so he's now addressing this is his first uh, his first message inspired directly by the Holy Spirit. He says, "Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day, nine nine a.m." But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I'll pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. Well, by any means today, we who are members of God's church, we who are part of the first fruits, we are not a large group at all. The Holy Spirit has not yet been poured out on all flesh, but he has been poured out on the first fruits. That's exactly the meaning of this holiday, brethren. When Herbert Armstrong was living and shortly thereafter, we had, when it comes to membership, upwards of 150,000 people uh, baptized about 100,000 people, then children and prospective members about 50,000. So we had about that number as far as I remember the statistics. And that was, however, misinterpreted by me and by others as God's power by which he was working. But as we look now at the numbers that we have now and things that happened ever since the death of Herbert Armstrong, we're actually coming to a different conclusion. At least I am. And that is, it is at the conclusion that it is not by power or might of numbers of people what we measure things by, you know, but by God's Spirit itself, by which He is doing things, and that numbers He is working through are few. We might say very few. We are the few that have been called, those who have been granted repentance, those who have been baptized, in which an old man has died, and we have been given God's Holy Spirit. Verse 38. Peter continues speaking his first inspired message by God, by his, by God's Spirit. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you. This is a, re, this is a command. This is not a recommendation, by the way. This is command. So those of you who are still wondering and, 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 and thinking about, it, well, if you are being called and this truth is being revealed to you, this is command. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will, this is the promise now, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. At that time, all who are far off was us. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Brethren, Pentecost and First Fruits pictures God's first spiritual harvest. Mortal human beings translated into spirit-composed God-beings. Does this click into our minds? Mortal human beings translated into spirit-composed God-beings. Yes, indeed. God's church shall be that firstborn harvest into God's family at Christ's return. To what church or what assembly have we been called? Hebrews 12. And for about several years I've been quoting this passage, Hebrews 12, verse 22 and 23, 
to uh, uh, those baptism candidates before they're baptized. Because I tell them, you're not being baptized into any denomination or sect of this world. You're being called to which church? To what assembly, if you wish? Hebrews 12, verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion, symbol of the church, and to the city of the living God and the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Now, what is important for us to understand and never allow it to fade within our minds, brethren, is the fact that we are a part of those first fruits. This day represents us receiving that spirit, that tree of life that was cut off from humankind in the Garden of Eden and what needed to be done. What needed to be done was Christ coming and dying for us to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This day of Pentecost points to and represents our calling. The first fruits include all those whom God has given his Holy Spirit. It is now payment on eternal life. It includes the prophets and those individuals that had God's Holy Spirit before Christ came and before he died. It includes now us before Christ returns. We need to fully believe that and, of course, live accordingly. But it is still not the end of the story, brethren. We cannot forget God's desire for humankind is that all of humankind be restored. Its ultimate destiny of becoming children of God, having a vibrant, loving relationship with Him as the Father, everyone as a family, assisting Him in establishing God's kingdom on earth. This is why we have been called now, in this day and age, when humankind as a whole is deceived. It is the reason all have been called from Abel to us. We have not been called at this time for our salvation alone. And that is what many obviously did not understand back in those days of Herbert Thompson. We have not been called for our salvation alone. It is for all of humankind that we as first fruits are to serve and assist in ushering in the kingdom of God and the eternal life for all humanity. We have a responsibility to use the Holy Spirit as given to us as it symbolizes this day. You see, the old man in each one of us that fought against everything that was God is dead. It was buried at baptism. God's Holy Spirit allows us to no longer be at enmity with God. It gives us the ability now to have a desire to know God, to know God's way of life, not like the rest of the world that resists God, fights God at every step. Brethren, it allows us the Spirit it allows us, the Spirit of God, to desire and yield to God and allow Him to write His laws in our hearts and minds in order to assist Christ in bringing many more children into God's kingdom. God's law is written in our hearts so completely that we can be perfect, righteous, and able to assist Christ in ruling, teaching, and administering God's law perfectly. Now, just as the Old Covenant was a marriage contract between God and the children of Israel, the New Covenant is also a marriage covenant. The new covenant will not be made with mortals who cannot keep their promises. It will be established only with immortal spirit beings that have been proved during this physical life by their lives lived by faith, their desire to obey and to serve God. The spirit-born church will become Christ's new covenant wife. And that divine marriage indeed is for a purpose you can read in Malachi chapter 2, verse 15, that the reason for marriage is holy offspring. It will produce children, a family. Christ and his spirit-born bride will be ruling and teaching team. Through them, God will open salvation to all, ultimately producing billions of spirit-born children of God with free access to the living water to the tree of life. God is the same, brethren, today, yesterday, and tomorrow and forever, he never deviates from his plan that requires a calling of his first fruits, of which we are part, whose purpose it is to become like his firstborn son by the power of his Holy Spirit and assist him in bringing salvation to the whole world. And the last scripture for today is Revelation 21. The question is, what will the first fruits ultimately be? Well, the next to last chapter in the Bible tells us, Revelation 21, verse 1, 
Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Well, God's purpose is to restore his kingdom on this earth, to give free access to the tree of life. It is his desire that all humankind be a part of that kingdom, a part of that family. Also, God has called us to be first fruits that will assist him in bringing many sons and daughters, of course, to glory. Let us keep this in our minds and let it define, brethren, who we are. I am Alexander Sashevelich, and this is the Continued Church of God. Happy Pentecost. Happy Feast of the First Fruits. Happy Feast of Weeks.